woke Take off your shades, it helps see through the smoke Cause the wicked hide behind the cloak And if you stay in the mist, you gon' be soaked So listen up, cause this hair of the dog What's real, what ain't, is this the fog or smog? Cause there's a difference when you breathe it in So don't let the corporate media take you for a spin This that morning show, they put you in the know So I hope that you ready, cause all we do is go, go, go Yeah, come get your info, you gon' be like, whoa Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hair of the Dog. I'm Andy Kennedy. It is Monday morning. Yes, it is Monday morning to you people that work. It's not a nice thing to say, but at least it's a beautiful day. Well, at least here, maybe not where you... Okay, never mind. I'm not going this with, with this any longer. Um, I, I keep finding the flaw in my intro as it goes along. I'm just going to uh, get right into it. I wanted to talk a little bit this morning uh, before we get underway. And we're hearing a lot of people that are uh, discussing, you know, we're a year into it now, right? And what that looks like, kind of like the top 100 songs of 2020. Uh, how our lives have changed, uh, what we've seen, what we've heard in the last year. And because we're right about the time now where everybody was starting to get a handle on what was happening and governments, um, because of their fear of what was about to happen, started shutting things down, even if they were neoliberal capitalists. And I think a lot of that was just the fear of the unknown. But what did we learn over the last year? And uh, if you're, you have an understanding of uh, macroeconomics and uh, how governments finance themselves, you had a lot of moments where you could point to certain situations and say, look, see, look, look, see and um what i'm talking about is how different governmental entities dealt with certain situations and how the government allowed the fed to backstop the stock market for a period of 30 days to the tune of almost 30 trillion dollars and what that means and why people's taxes didn't go up for that and unfortunately and this goes part and parcel with a macroeconomic uh, podcast, Macro and Cheese, that uh, we just released on the weekend, where a, um, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Fozzi did an article in early April of last year that asked the question, is COVID-19 the death of neoliberalism? And it was actually a, a very thoughtful article because it looked at the impending year before it actually happened with quite a degree of insight. And if we had a society that was maybe a little bit more in tune or plugged into what is actually happening in different countries around the world, like Canada and the United States, we might have had a moment where neoliberalism had been in its death throes. But unfortunately, there's still not enough people that understand that uh, poverty, homelessness, unemployment are all political choices and not the norm. And so as we move forward, we're going to have to decide as a society how we're going to um, deal with these issues because none of the real problems that are still uh, here have gone away in any way. So this is a good opportunity for interflection, but it's also uh, a time where if we start to listen to one another, maybe we can start to understand what's going on. And I think that'll make a huge difference, especially moving forward. While there's still a lot of people that are have to go to food lines 
and in getting thrown out of their houses. And on that note, I think I should probably introduce my lovely and talented co-host, Ms. Carrie Barber. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning, Andy. You said you had a rant, and that was the politest, nicest rant ever. Let me paraphrase this for everyone who just didn't get it because Andy was so nice. Quit being stupid. Learn MMT. Taxes don't fund any of the federal programs. They don't. We don't need to raise taxes. And I kept seeing this, Andy, from our broadcast on uh, Medicare for All, that pro platform. Even diehard advocates, the same people I was so upset about, were saying, we need to raise tax. We don't. We don't need to raise taxes for any of these programs. So that is the two by four that you might need. Um, <laughs> none of these, these are political choices, as Andy said. It, we don't need to raise taxes for any federal program. In fact, insurance companies right now, when it comes to Medicare for all, are not paid by your taxes. They're paid through the federal appropriations process under ACA. Go back and watch our Friday broadcast. We explain it all to you. Please learn it, MMT, MMT, learn it. Okay. And right. uh, yeah, and that, that's, that's very, um, uh, thank you for playing. <laughs> the bad cop to my nice cop. And, yeah, you know, always. I, but I just, I just, I kind of, while I was having a shower this morning, I was kind of formulating this, how I was going to, to put this narrative. And I think that it was, it, it was kind of stuck in my head last evening when I was hearing one of the uh, mainstream media pundits talk about how we used the term new normal, right, mm -hmm. last year. And how, how we're going to be living with this. If you really think about it, we really didn't have to, right? This was the unfettered neoliberal capitalist way of, you know, sacrificing Americans to save the market, mm -hmm. right? And had the country not been so tribalized, people maybe would have seen that, right? Well, um, and, and, that, and especially that yeah. it's the new normal right is is really just a smokescreen because if anything the biden administration is just a return to the status quo right and that's that oh and by the way shout out to um fiorella and craig of convo couch their footage was used last night in a segment of 60 minutes when they were talking about bringing um some of the rioters on January the 6th to, to criminal charges against them. So if you are of the impression that uh, the, the outlets, the media outlets like ourselves don't hold any clout, you are mistaken. Oh, absolutely. We know that we, the, in particular on our network, when we broke, what was it, six stories last year? They were watching us and actually used the same sources that we used. Um, we didn't get the footage, but yeah. So, so we can go on forever, but we, we've got a, a big topic today that I want to get to um, that I think is part and parcel to this. So this is part three in our series that we have done when it comes to guardianship, estate trafficking. Um, in the Brenda Bryant case, that is outright uh, racketeering. And um, these, these are symptoms of part of this economic downturn, right? So when you, have, when you have this push to get money from any source possible, right? The hidden tax, things like stoplight cameras, which these things don't seem connected, but the stoplight camera is just another hidden tax. This is where, when the Fed cuts off spending, in the states, the states have to pick up that revenue or, or cut services. So they're going to find any way possible. And in Brenda's case, and then we talked to Rick Black, the states were actually using the guardianship in many cases to siphon off um, the retirement accounts and the estates of their own people. And so this is part, part that was part one and part two. And I posted the link so that you can go back and watch that. And I, I want to stress that this is not something that just happens to other people. It's not something that happens to people with money. Think about it where, you know, anybody, if you're putting away $20 a week for your retirement, 
at some point, depending on where you put that money, uh, you're going to have a million dollars when you retire. It just, it, it will add up, especially if you started when you were 20 and did everything that you're supposed to do. And now you have this this weird situation, this horrific situation where your money can be um, taken by the state and you can end up in guardianship. So we explored some of those stories in part one and part two that seemed like different, like you had Brenda with, Brenda is now a fugitive and her child, her adult child was taken from her. And then Rick Black talked about um, doctors, retired doctors and other people in other parts of the country who went through the same thing. They themselves were kidnapped by the state. So now we're going to get into something that is related or along these same guardianship laws. And what rights do we actually have as family members? What can we do? So many of you, um, like Andy and I, we grew up with a gentleman by the name of Casey Kasem. He, I remember as a kid doing, you know, the, the baby pirating thing where I would sit with my little Walkman and have my blank uh, tape recorder and wait for Casey Kasem to come on because I knew which songs he was going to play and he would announce them. And then I would record my favorite songs and, and, that became my hot mix tape <laughs> version 32 that I would take to school and I would play with, you know, all of my friends. So this was a gentleman that I grew up with for 40 years. He had this career that spanned so many different areas and he was in our living rooms and our hearts for so long. And then what happened to him and his family is just this horrific example of what we're going to talk about today. And we are so privileged to have uh, Carrie Case mom. Before I bring her on, though, I just want to do a flashback for those, um, what is the, the, young, the millennials, well, the, the younger millennials and everyone else, to reintroduce them to who Casey Case was. I guarantee you, you know him and you may not even realize it based on the body of work that he did. So, Andy, you want to go ahead and play that? Absolutely. Thank you. Hello again, and welcome to American Top 40. I'm Casey Kasem, and I'm all set to count down the biggest hits in the USA. According to the official Billboard survey, these are the records you're buying and radio stations are playing all over America. Now, before we start our climb to the number one song in the land this week, let's review last week's top three. Our exclusive review of the top ten on Billboard's Pop, Soul, Country, and Album Charts for the week ending May 26th, 1985. Now, here's Casey Kasem. Thank you and hello again, everybody. Welcome to America's Top Ten. Now, our album spotlight song of the week. It's by a man who does his recording the old-fashioned way, without mixing, splicing, or editing. You know, 99% of the records today are made by recording voices and instruments on separate tracks, then mixing them all together until the sound is just right. But Tom Petty says he doesn't like to work that way. He says his songs are recorded just as they're played. Tom says, quote, you do a take and the song either has that magic or it doesn't. You wait for the magic to happen rather than creating it with a pair of scissors. Here's Tom Petty and his band, The Heartbreakers, with a song that's full of magic. From the album Southern Accents, here's Don't Come Around Here No More. Now, how many of you know the show Scooby-Doo? Yeah. There's a character that I play on that show, the sidekick of Scooby-Doo for the past 17 or 18 years, and his name is Shaggy. And Shaggy would like to say a few words to the young people out there, all right? Go and ahead. he's always talking about his good buddy Scoob, his old friend, his old pal, his old dear, dear buddy. Good day, eh? Welcome to Canada's Top 5 Countdown. Today we're looking at the top five greatest people in Canadian history. Starting at number five, it's the great one, Wayne Gretzky, the greatest hockey player the world has ever seen. You know what they say, the bigger they are, the louder they crash. Hey, Devastator, you'll get a real charge out of this. Oh, <laughs> well, I guess I did think about the job once or twice. Uh, lots of times. Oh, no, my name's Harold. Uh, Harold Hassenpfeffer. Oh, 
I guess I'm Peter Cottontail. Nay, Pippa, not till Bilbo has cut it. Will he never cut the cake? Welcome back, crime fans. Our next wanted criminal spent most of last year in a career slump. But a couple of bank robberies and a kidnapping shot him back up the charts to number one. Here's the cover of his latest wanted poster. Holy science fiction, Batman. What was that? Holy Houdini, Batman. There's no way to get out of here. Holy short stories, Batman. How will we ever get Superman, Wonder Woman, and Hawkman out of these books? I think, um, my own personal opinion, I, I think K Casey was such a unique, uh, uh, radio or television guy, not just because he had this amazing radio voice, but the fact that it was so unique as well, right? That the second you heard Casey's voice, you knew it was him. Right. There oh, was absolutely. nobody, nobody that had a voice like him in radio. That's what that's what made him so special. He was just a master of his craft. Right. And everybody knew who he was. And he seemed genuine. And I think that's why everybody loved him. So the question then becomes, if you have somebody who is so iconic and so loved, I mean, and ubiquitous everywhere, how could something tragic happen to him? So now I want to introduce our, our guest. This is... Um, Casey Kasem's daughter, Carrie Kasem, who went through a horrific situation at the end of her father's life, but managed to turn that into um, a cause for activism that has actually changed the law in many states to give us all rights that you may not know exist. So good morning, Carrie. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so you, your dad, we all know your dad. There was no one who did not love this man. I mean, no one. And uh, <laughs> let's get into it right away then. Okay. So, That's a, that was a perfect segue. Gary. It was. It was. So, um, all right, so let's go through the story for people who may not be aware. I remember seeing news clippings of some crazy woman and I'm trying to be objective, but it, when you're throwing raw meat at people on a driveway, right? that's not exactly sane. So take us through what happened in, in your dad's situation. Well, in my situation, uh, when my father was diagnosed in 2007 with Parkinson's, which actually turned out to be Lewy body dementia, could have had both, but because we were not privy to uh, the medical records from then on, uh, or when my dad got sick enough and he couldn't share with us, we actually didn't know what was going on. But uh, when he did get sick enough, his wife decided to and, and li literally physically lock the gates, turn his phones off, fire his staff, uh, and keep everyone and anyone who loved him away from him, not just us kids, his brother, aunts, uncles, best friends, people he worked with, uh, nobody could get a hold of my dad. And they were calling us frantic. We were trying to get a hold of my dad and see him. We saw my dad every single week. We saw him, we talked to him almost every day on the phone. This wasn't like we'd come in and out, which, you know, a lot of times uh, his wife would say that, that we were just coming back in. We were estranged. Not, none of that was true. We had pictures, videos, friends, testimony. We saw my dad every every single week. In fact, I worked for him for years where I saw him every day. And, uh, you know, it, it, when, when my father got sick enough and he couldn't say no, or he couldn't get up out of his bed, or he couldn't dial that phone, uh, she cut him off from everybody he knew and loved, everyone. And, you know, I, I, called, I called Adult Protective Services and they could do nothing. I called the police, they could do nothing because my dad was living in his home and his wife said, I don't want these people in there. And that would be trespassing if we went into somebody's home that didn't want us there. Even if it was a house you grew up in, you spent your whole life there, it doesn't matter. So I learned very quickly uh, that really there were no laws in place for adult children wanting to see 
their mom or dad if they're under the care of a cooperative uncooperative caretaker. Now there's there's different laws for grandma and and grandpa rights. There's if you're under 18 you have rights, but not, when once you turn 18 you have no rights to see your parents in this country if there is an uncooperative caretaker in place taking care of mom or dad. So I thought okay, we'll just we'll we'll go to court and you know, of course the judge will see we're good kids. We can we can you know, prove it. We'll, we'll, we have lots of videotape and pictures and, and my dad's friends and, and, uh, even with that, and even when, uh, my dad told his own lawyer and the court appointed attorney, I want to see my children emphatically said, I want to see my kids. Not only do I want to see my kids, I want my kids helping make medical decisions on my behalf. And with all this information, judge Leslie Green could not make a, a, a ruling on just visitation. We had to go, uh, either it was going to be a fight over power of attorney or guardianship or conservatorship. I remember this very clearly when when all the information came in with all the interviews with my dad and, and Judge Leslie Green said, Casey Kasem wants to see his kids. You're all sophisticated attorneys. Now go out in the hallway and figure it out. Judge, if we could could have done that, we would have. And we can't figure this out. We're here because we need you to rule on visitation. And that was not happening. So I realized, okay, I'm either going to, I'm going to continue this fight, but if I don't win in the court of law, I'm going to change the law. And that's where that bill started. My case and cares foundation started. I was going to do anything and everything to see my dad again. And, uh, you know, it, we went through months and months and months of fighting in court. Um, you know, my, my sister and I went for uh, conservatorship and that was denied at first. Um, and then, you know, she, but the judge did want to get us uh, visitation. My sister and brother, when we were out in that hallway trying to negotiate, um, did sign a, uh, it, it was, it wasn't even a legal form. It was just an agreement stating that they could see my dad once or twice a month with an armed guard in the room uh, with, uh, they could only go in single file. My sister couldn't bring her kids. There was no cameras, no phones, no uh, computers allowed. Um, and and it was, it, I said, I'm not signing this. And I turned to my brother and said, we're not signing this. That's not an inmate. This is insane. Uh, but behind my back, they did, they, they signed it. Let's back up a little bit because this was after, there's so much to unpack. This well, let, let me just say real quick too, so people don't think I have animosity about that. I was very angry. Didn't speak to them for four months. Um, they could no longer fight with me. They gave up every right to fight in court for my dad. They gave up, you know, they couldn't go after uh, Jean Thompson Kasem anymore. I, it was just me. And I felt at that point very uh, alone. But then, you know, I realized they just wanted to see my dad. You know, I came to that conclusion that they just want to see dad and they're going to do everything. But they did not look at the consequences of doing that. So I just, I want people to know I wasn't, I, I understood why they did it. Okay, so so put it in context here. You had already been fighting this battle with your stepmom for a long time before that hallway meeting. It was, I mean, we couldn't, she started to say you, you can't see your dad or your dad is tired or all these excuses starting late July, late June, early July. We then, I did a, I did a protest and I remember thinking this, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to protest. Well, it was gonna, not even a protest. I was going to stand outside my dad's house with the sign that says, Gene, why won't you let me see my dad? And I thought if I just did that, then it's just going to be like step kid against step mom. I'm like, wait, let's get everybody that can't talk to him. Everybody should stand out there holding a sign, nothing defamatory, nothing at all. But I got I don't know, 20, 25 people out there holding signs and, you know, Casey's best friend of 63 years, Casey's right-hand man of 27 years. My, I missed my brother. My dad's brother came out, you know, like all these people who meant everything, Casey, we're your voice now. We stood there. This was before any court action took place. We're like, let's just let her know we mean business. We want to see dad again. That didn't work. Um, so yeah, that's then, then we went into court after that September, uh, uh like uh, October, November, um, December, January. We we got a couple visits in uh, December when we were in court. She wanted to show the judge that she was doing the right thing and letting visitation happen. That we had a few visitations with my father uh, at a uh, I'm not even going to say subpar facility, 
um, where he con contracted sepsis and went to the ICU. And so my oh dad, my goodness. yeah, my dad had plenty of money to be in his home with 24 hour caretakers. Uh, and that didn't happen. There were housekeepers taking care of him who loved him and who did the best they could, but they, he didn't have 24 hour care. And, uh, so she, she would hide him. And I know this because when I did win conservatorship over my father, guardianship over my father, I got to see all the medical records. And my stepmother would drop him off at different hospitals around Los Angeles as a babysitter while she was with her boyfriend. So I got all of that. And I, you know, when, when Jean, Jean would constantly get in front of the camera and say, you know, APS has cleared me of everything. Adult Protective Services has cleared me of everything. And they've never found anything. You know, these kids keep calling Adult Protective Services. No, no, no. The hospitals have called Adult Protective Services on you because you wouldn't pick your husband up. And I have all of that. I have all the records. I have an entire sheet. Sheets can't get a hold of wife, can't get a hold of wife, can't get a hold probably 50 times. And she would do that. So you had the hospital records, you had your own family, you had his brother, you had all of his friends, all of the stuff that reasonably you would think would be enough to go forward in court. And yet, you know, you, you mentioned this judge, Judge Green, who seemed reticent for whatever reason to make a decision that was well within their purview. Well, they, she said it wasn't. She, there is no law, um, there's no jurisdiction allowing her to just give visitation without a, a fight over uh, guardianship, conservatorship, or um, power of attorney. And that's that was the excuse. Even though I think she could have made a ruling, many judges do, she wouldn't do it. Mm, okay. So this set up this this fight. So when it comes, oh, you, you mentioned that your stepmom was um, perhaps out with a, a new boyfriend which might explain some of the uh, issues that were going on. Do you think uh, besides, you know, boy, that's, a, I'm, I'm, I'm in shock because like, um, I have a stepmother and my dad is now exhibiting signs of um, maybe some memory loss. I, how did you not go in with a baseball bat is my first question, but that's not reasonable. Um, so, it sets all this stuff up in, in my head though. I was thinking, is she trying some new age, maybe unproven um, medical treatment or something you, she didn't want you guys to know about? It just doesn't make any reasonable sense why she would go through these efforts, particularly with an armed guard. Have you ever threatened her before or? No, no, the armed guard was um, just in, in any way that she could hurt us, she would. She hated us. She just hated us. And even my dad said that too, finally. You know, it's like we, there was a, a running joke because for about 15, 20 years, my dad kept telling us it would get better and she would learn to love us. Like it was constant. She's gonna, it'll get better. It'll get better. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Her behavior towards us and my father was extremely abusive and mean and cruel. And I remember probably probably about, I don't know, 20 years into it. We're in the car. It's my brother and my sister, my father. And he had just gotten off the phone with her and he was on his car phone. You could hear him, you could hear her screaming because that's how she talked to him. She would just scream at him. I mean, constantly, every day there was, she was screaming at him. And we said, dad, when's enough enough? Why don't you tell her to stop? Why don't you, you know, fight back? And he just, you know, it'll get better. It's gonna get better. And all of us just took a, a, this pause and we all just started laughing. Like, it was like, we're gonna either cry or laugh. Like it was, like, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And there was, it was just like some kind of release. We just started laughing like, dad, wake up. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was very hard to watch that because he's such a beautiful, kind, gentle soul. Like he loves everybody. He loved her, he loved her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, he gave her the world. And when he needed her most, she abandoned him. She treated him cruelly. I wish to God she was giving him some kind of alternative treatment or, or caring to even do so. That did not happen in any way, shape or form. In fact, it was the opposite. She wouldn't give him his proper medications. She wouldn't um, give him proper care. Wow. So 
Um, you and I talked about this before we got started, and I went back and looked at other interviews as this story had developed from years ago. And the single question that kept coming up over and over again, whether directly posed to you and your siblings or off, off, you know, off the interview, was this is all about the money. This was all about the estate. This was about the, the house and the fortune that your father had amassed in his work. Um, so would you like to respond to that? Sure, sure. We said, and if you go back into all the interviews, it's like my dad left us a trust and that was it. And we didn't even know we were in the will. We were. She took us out of different. Uh, she she had him redo his will and estate plans uh, in 2011 when he was in 2009 unable to read his American Top 40 script. Uh, very, had a very, very hard time. Uh, and in 2011, she had written a, a letter using a man, a uh, doctor named Dr. Anderson to write a letter stating that my dad was not, had not cog cognitively able to do his taxes, to do anything. Um, he was unable. She wrote a whole thing to the IRS, an entire letter stating my dad could not, uh, was, was cognitively impaired. And she used that not to pay her taxes or to have, not be penalized, right? And, uh, but yet in 2011, she had my dad change his entire will and estate plans, power of attorney, everything. And we had, you know, people come in to deposition saying, I was there. He didn't understand what he was doing. He asked me what this was. I couldn't explain it to him. She just said, sign it. Um, so we had, we have all this like evidence and, and information now of what really happened, but, uh, yeah, we were just, my dad said, you know, you have a trust. I'm like, okay. We didn't talk about it, which now I, I always, always say, please talk to your kids, talk to your family and do it all together. What do you want to leave them? Is it, you know, do you want, is it this much? Is that much do you want to leave them? Like my dad, all I asked was for his watch. He left me his watch, which I, since I was a kid, I always saw this watch on my dad's hand. That's all I wanted. And he did give that to me, but you know, he just said, look, you know, you have a trust and we, we didn't care. We didn't. Okay, great. I'm self-sufficient. I've been working since, you know, I was able to, my brother is, is uh, doing extremely well. My sister is a physician's assistant married to a doctor from UCLA. We're all self-sufficient. Uh, so we didn't care about my dad's money. You know, it was like, okay, whatever you want to give us, give us. And whatever you don't, don't. So there was never a time when we were fighting in court where we asked for money in that entire year. There was never a time. We didn't go for it. We didn't go for his finances. We didn't go for anything. Um, so I guess uh, it was it's hard to hear that because it was like there was nothing in any of the court cases where we asked for that. N nothing on TV where we asked for that. So you said something interesting, and this this kind of harkens back to the interview we did with Brenda, because in Brenda's case, her uh, daughter had turned 18, but was mentally um, at the stage of, I think she described a seven or a nine-year-old that was diagnosed. It was uh, fully understood, but yet the state in that case had her daughter check herself in in this, what amounted to kidnapping, the state was ushering her into this facility. So on one hand, you know, this person is incapacitated and you've got that proven, diagnosed, but then um, flip it around and you have that person signing a contract. So the exact same thing happened in your dad's situation. How is any of that legal? That happens all the time in guardianships. That happens all the time. They put people who are, uh, they are with it. You know, I, we, we saved a 54 year old from guardianship. She came into some money and her stepsisters and a gynecologist put her in a guardianship and stole everything she had. So, um, you know, we, we got some angel donors and a, and a, a year later and close to a million dollars, we got her out of it. But um, it's, I mean, we were told by everybody, um, they told her to run to Mexico, go to Canada, and we just said, stick, stick it out. We're going to get you out of this. And we did. We've gotten a few people out of guardianship, but it's, it's a ridiculous amount of money. And they, there has to be guardianship reform. It is, it is a human trafficking of our elderly and the most vulnerable. And it's disgusting what they've done to Brenda, what they did to Rick and, and Terry, his wife, the people that I come across, all the victims that are that are still happening. I'm so, so happy that things are uh, coming to the mainstream. Like, I care a lot, that movie, right? Um, and it's, unfortunately, and we talked about this, Carrie, 
Um, you only hear about things when there's somebody with a ton of money or a famous, you know, that, and then it's like the Glenn Campbell, BB King, Mickey Rooney, then you hear about it. But what about all these thousands of people who have had worked their entire lives to leave something to their children or to their alma mater? And where's it going? To attorneys they've never met, to guardians, for-profit guardians or the state, people they've never met. Why? In, in the name of we're going to care for you? No, you have a lot of these people, their, their um, families are not notified that they're being put under guardianship. And the guardians lie. Oh, we tried to notify them. No, you didn't. And this, these people need to be in jail like April Parks. And I'm sure you know The Guardian from Billy Mintz. It's a phenomenal film. And if people are listening to this and they, they're not quite getting how deep this goes and how evil it is, watch the, the documentary, The Guardian. Rick Black is in that, uh, a woman who, um, who has been working the, the, the Case and Cares hotline. Julie Belshi is in that. But um, it really, really, really does show what's going on in this country. So it's The Guardian by Billy Mintz. Please, please, please watch this. It's it's really does show the extent of what these people will go to. We, we will definitely post that link, but let's get into what, what you are actually doing with Kaysom Cares. You've actually done something that I think um, all, most of our audience have activism in their blood, and you have actually achieved not in just one state, but in many states, that kind of change. How did you do it? And what exactly is the case and cares law? Sure. Um, so when I was going through this, like I said before, and I realized, okay, I'm gonna have to change a lot to see my dad. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. My mom was involved in politics. So was my dad and my uh, stepdad's a lobbyist. But I remember thinking, how do I write a bill? How do I do this? How do I fix this? And, and I, re I remember, <laughs> On the phone, I was trying, my friend who's a lobbyist in, uh, in, in Sacramento, how do I get this bill done? How do, and my, my stepdad turns to me and goes, uh, you know what I do for a living, Carrie? I, I will help you with this bill. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. So Bob's like, look, we, we, you know, we got to get a bill. My attorney at the time had written something, a partial bill, never went anywhere a few years before. Uh, we took some of that bill. We took we took uh, some of my language, Bob's language. Uh, it was a, there was a representative, Mike Gatto, Gatto, at the time was here in the legislator, legislature, and he contacted us when we were. I kept talking about it on the news. I kept talking about my case from cares and changing the law, and and he contacted us and said we'll help you with that. And he had just lost his father. Uh, his lost his father to someone murdered him, and he and he knew what it was like not to see your dad, and. We got the bill passed here in California, but during this, during, you know, I, I was on a syndicated show called Sixth Sense. I was talking about my ordeal. I was talking all over the news about it. People started writing me. I'm in this. I don't have a famous last name. I don't, I don't have any money. My mom is taken from me. My dad has been taken from me. My child's been taken from me and put under guardianship and I can't do anything about it. And I thought, well, I'm not just going to do this for me and, and my family but I have to keep going. And, and, and I did. And it was just this, I've never felt this fire in me. I guess I had a little bit of my dad in me. He was such an activist and a humanitarian. And, and I felt this fire in me. And I, I, I just kept going. I kept going state to state with my bill. And I got it. We got, we have the, the case of cares visitation bill, which allows a judge to just grant visitation under uh, a, uh, under somebody who's, who's um, being isolated with somebody who's being isolated. Um, it could be sometimes they will put guardianship in the bill. Sometimes it's watered down. We don't get guardianship in there. So it's just people who are under power of attorney or uh, in a, in a um, residential home. So it, it just depends on what state gives you what, but we've done our best to try and get some kind of visitation law. We have 12 states with 13 bills and nine other states have adopted a version of the case and cares visitation bill. So we're doing our best, but things need, they definitely need to be stronger. I know Rick Black has a federal bill. Uh, Dr. Sam Sugar has worked so hard in um, in uh, in Florida, and and he's he has a conference coming up. Uh, I think it's April 11th. I'm speaking at. There are so many people. Uh, Lisa McCarley out here with the the Free Britney movement. There, are, it's just it's moving forward. Things are moving forward, and it's really it's really good to see that. So you actually mentioned uh, Britney Spears, and, and again, going back to a celebrity or a famous person where this happens, and then it kind of shines a light. 
In fact, with Brittany's case, there were talks now with the House Judiciary Committee hosting hearings and inviting Ms. Spears to speak on her issue. So, so that again plays into the advocacy work that Rick Black is doing. How are you feeling about this now that maybe it, it could move forward a little bit in Congress where you've got somebody, a strong advocate like Rick, and then you've got the celebrity of Brittany. Are you feeling like this is finally getting some traction after years and years of hard work? Yes, thank God, because there are so many, I have so many cases of people really, really, really wanting to see mom or dad and they're still alive. I have a, I have a case in, um, in uh, Iowa where mom has been isolated for five years and the girls, out of nine kids, the girls just got some visitation a couple of years ago, but going on six years being isolated because, because the, the other family members wanted the house and all the money. You know, sickening. Um, so thank God this is this is hitting Congress. Thank God, you know, people are really sitting up and listening. And the Free Britney movement has absolutely moved this, uh, you know, issue to to the forefront. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've been asked to speak on the Free Britney movement and this and that. And here's my uh, dilemma, I guess you could say, or rub uh, is is Sam Ingham, the PVP attorney who uh, is, you know, is, is involved in the Britney Spears case, is the conservator there. Um, he, in my case, told the judge that we should be, he, he actually did the right thing and said, Casey wants to see his kids, give visitation to them, you know, I, and the judge then made me a temporary conservator slash guardian um, here in California and did the right thing. So I don't know Sam at all, uh, he did the right thing in, in my case. So it was very hard to speak against him. But I do think that guardian reform is a must. It has to happen. It's legalized like trafficking. It's it's criminal. It's criminal. And I'll tell you one thing, which is disgusting, is that you're going to take somebody's rights away. We put somebody under guardianship. You take every single right they have. A dog has more rights than somebody under guardianship, a full guardianship. You take it and you don't allow that person to come into court and speak on their behalf because some guardian's like, oh, it's not going to be good for them. If all my rights were taken away, I don't care if I'm a vegetable, wheel me in and ask me the questions. I don't, you know, so and judges don't allow that person to speak on their behalf. Are you mm -hmm. kidding me? But yet we will allow children to testify. Sure. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And, you know, the cynic in me, after listening to Rick and Brenda and then going through part of your story, I'm like, we have the foxes guarding the hen house in a lot of cases. Like when we look at the entire South Carolina legislature, uh, the majority of them are lawyers with private practices who had their cases tried before the judges in these probate cases. So it's kind of one hand washes the other. And it's just, you know, Andy and I have done so many shows on the, the dual justice system and, and the inequality inherent therein. So this is, I don't want to minimize it as just another symptom of it, but this affects all of us. And this to me is another way where all of our, we don't have much, we don't, most of us, and yet, this is all at risk, not just from your estate and your savings, but your life um, taking away your family. So I really applaud all the work that you're doing. And that is, um, you have my utmost respect uh, and admiration for taking this tragedy and putting it into actually legislation so that uh, families in these states can, can get some protection. So if it is not in my state, and I want it to be, how do I get involved with your organization to make sure that we're all protected? I get that question a lot and thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, if you go to caseomcares.org, uh, you can see the states that we have it in, but uh, we are working on certain states right now, which I stopped naming because I had a uh, Facebook stalker. Actually, it's no joke. I got a restraining order on this person for <sighs> because every time I'd announce where the bill was, she'd go and do everything she could to fight against it. So I stopped announcing where I'm at um, unless it's, you know, pretty much there and we're, we're going for it. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, as I'm trying to get these bills through for four years, I'm having 
you know, uh, somebody literally doing everything they can not, not, not to allow that to happen. It's, it, it, it's crazy, but we have four or five more states now going through who, who knows if they'll pass it, but they're moving forward. And, um, if, if you want to know what states we're working on, if you want to get the bill in your state, we give you the bill. We, we come in, we testify. And when I say we, it's, uh, the case and cares team, the board, um, letters that we've received over the years. So uh, people in that state will come testify or write letters. So it's not, I, we can literally walk you through how to get the bill done. And I will be there to support it. And, and I will, I will help you. I'll even fly out to your state if they allow that. But yeah, if you write me at Carrie at Kasem Cares, and that Carrie spelled just like you. So K-E-R-R-I, Carrie at Kasem, K-A-S-E-M, cares.org. Um, I will get back to you. Sometimes I get a lot of mail. So if it takes me a few days, I apologize, but I will help you get the bill there. And, and um, please, I, we, we need the boots on the ground. That is really, really who does it. There are people that I've never had to go uh, to a state. I give them the bill and they just go, go, go. Carrie Ford, uh, Sandy Baxes, uh, Crystal Fishon. Like these are people that went, took the bill and just ran with it. And without them, we wouldn't have gotten the bill passed in Louisiana or Alabama um, or Illinois. Like, like Sandy got two bills passed in Illinois for us. So, you know, it, it, these, these amazing advocates, the boots on the ground in the States, they're, they're what really do a lot of the work. That's that's amazing. And Andy, you brought it up at the top of the show, with, um, like particularly here in New Mexico, we're having a, a huge issue with elders, particularly in tribal lands, um, being isolated because of COVID and, you know, just all of these things that are coming together, you know, to show that our system is inherently broken. Um, right. that, that, yeah, I, I think that this is a phenomenal idea and a way to start pulling back on, on some of the issues that we have seen all across this country. So thank you so much. Andy, before um, we let our guests go, please, please. And real quick too, Carrie, since yeah. you're in New Mexico, uh, a journalist by the name of Diane Diamond did a five-part series on guardianship in New Mexico. Amazing. This woman really, she's an incredible investigative journalist. Uh, so check that out. And also we rescued a man too in, in New Mexico and we had the bill going through there and it looked like it was going to pass. But once again, the woman reared her ugly head and, and, and got it stopped. That was, that was the last straw until I got a restraining order on her, but we almost had the bill in New Mexico, but we, we did save, we did, did save Mr. Martinez, the gentleman from New Mexico and Lori Martinez. It was an amazing daughter and worked her butt off to, to get him free and back home. So yeah, if you if you if you can check out the the five part series by Diane Diamond on guardianship. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and, and hold on after we close because now I want to know who this person is. I'm in New Mexico <laughs> now. <laughs> That's not gonna fly. <laughs> so um, yeah, Andy. Yes. So yeah, that's um, and and just a quick side note that uh, a lot of the examples that Carrie was giving was given giving about uh, where they've had this bill passed are you know quote unquote red states right and so I think that's a that's a huge thing that that in Republican controlled states that that these you know typically would be the harder of the colored states to to get to make the change right so this is that's a very uh, that's a, a very um, uh, encouraging sign. Yeah. Uh, my my uh, impression of all of this, and I think that it all comes around in a full circle when we we it, what Carrie, you and I have talked about on a number of occasions, why the things like this occur, and I think that it has to do with the fact that we don't see any laws in place to protect people. Is that it quite honestly just again comes down to a place where bad actors, um, large corporations, entities that would basically try to steal someone's wealth or steal someone's finance um, that we that we don't have these laws in place that will facilitate those kind of conditions, right? Yeah. 
And it's all about the capitalist, unfettered capitalism that, you know, thinks of everything as a market and uh, boils human life down to how much does it cost to take care of you versus how much do you own? Right. And I, I think that that's uh, just another example of the broken society we live in. And what's the difference? The difference now is people are starting to hear about this, right? And, you know, I, uh, the unfortunate situation, Carrie, that happened to your dad, you know, for an amazing human being that contributed so many things to our society and how um, his demise ended up the way it did and... Quite honestly, Britney Spears, uh, if you remember, you know, her as a teenager growing up and how her career and her life was just, you know, made into a money making uh, 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 thing that that she was she'd been exploited her her entire life. And now we look at things and how they haven't changed and how this person has just been, you know, had people ride on her coattails and get rich on, on, you know, because of her fame, we need to get these, the word out and, and the information and people opening their eyes to seeing this is what the difference is now. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is huge. And I salute you, Carrie, because what you're doing is not only taking a horrible situation that happened to you and um, you know, learning how you dealt with it, but making a change so that very few people have to go through what you went through. And that's the, the epitome of, of being a selfless activist in our society. So it's, it's a wonderful thing you're doing. And I'm really glad that you, uh, you shared it with us today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, Carrie. I mean, I really appreciate you giving me a platform to talk about this and, and to just really shine a light on this. And you've done this not only with, with me, but Brenda and Rick, and I hope you continue to do it because this is such a, it's, um, it's an epidemic and it, we need to thank God it's in Congress, right? Thank God we're, we're going to hopefully pass some bills here that, that might make a difference. So thank you for being part of the movement. Yes, absolutely. And if we can impose and get you to hold on just for a moment, but um, it, I, I have a personal bias, obviously, uh, because as I went through the story with the, the case and family, I couldn't help but notice that media sensationalized it and didn't explain the deeper issue. It was all about making sure that they got eyeballs on this yeah, ambulance chasing type of story, did not explain it to the viewers and thereby did a disservice. And likewise with the, the case of, and, and every other case out there, it comes down to corporate owned media. So obviously I have a bias, we are publicly funded. So we take a different tact and, and we look at things from a different way. So I just wanna do a real quick plug for Wednesday. We are gonna have an activist and our fellow journalist, Rome Bathia on and Rome is constantly getting uh, harassment and takedowns on social media, particularly by the K-Hive for some reason has it out for Rome. But Rome has this huge event coming up in Detroit, a Detroit area that looks like a war zone because of unregulated, unfettered, um, just going after the citizens and not repairing the, the damage done by, by uh, foreclosure and all of these sorts of things. So Rome has taken it his time and gathered up resources for the homeless. And he, he is literally going to be out there cooking food for anybody who wants it, come to this community event, all of these sort of things. And in repayment for his effort, he has now been banned for life on Twitter. He has been in Facebook jail more times than I can count. And all of this are because people are, um, they're constantly just reporting him. It doesn't matter what he says, just reporting his accounts. And he's a journalist. So when people complain about free speech, this literally is free speech. It's, it's included in the two lines of the First Amendment for journalists. And we are fighting to give him back his voice and help with his particular event. So stick, stay tuned on Wednesday, we'll have that. Um, and then once again, it's just, we've got uh, so many things coming up this week. So stay
stick around for the DLF network. We've got interviews and hosts and all of these things that um, we hope that you will tune into. And just my personal plea, if you are tired and frustrated with corporate media, the way that we change the entire narrative and our political landscape is you supporting independent media. And a network like ours or any other, pick one that you like for a dollar a month. I guarantee you that's how we start to get them to do what they're supposed to do. And you support investigative journalism, good old fashioned investigative journalism. So thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, Andy, you wanna take us out real quick? Absolutely. Um, but I'm not gonna add anything because I think that that was that just about summed it up, Gary. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, Carrie. Carrie number two. What's free speech? Tough. What's free speech? <laughs> Wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. It's 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 so hard trying to deal with two people of the same name. I I think they did that. I, I actually don't believe that that's your name. I just think you did that just to mess me up. So anyways, everybody, enjoy your Monday as best you can. We'll see you here on Wednesday morning. Take care. We bout that A, we in the song, we out here, yeah. Speeding the facts, how we supposed to be. Hammer the dog, we keep it in G. What?